Today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show, we're going to take a look at Rascal News. There is a fantastic video that Ginny D did on the struggle of playing D&D with ADHD. Shadow of the Weird Wizard has been released by Rob Schwab. We're going to talk about using character factions, how factions for characters can better tie characters and players to the game that they're playing in. We're going to talk about the many right answers of TTRPGs and four words that make our entire discourse of TTRPGs better. And we're going to cover more questions from the February 2024 Patreon Q&A, all today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show. I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things in TTRPGs. This show is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons of Sly Flourish get access to the City of Arches source book, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, a dedicated Discord server, the, men- the monthly Patreon Q&A, a whole bunch of tools to help you run your games, and much, much more. To the patrons of Sly Flourish, thank you so much for your outstanding support. There is a new RPG news website called Rascal, Rascal News. Alternative Independent Roguelike is their nation. A bunch of different publishers, a bunch of different writers who wrote for different publications have now, are now on their own and are writing specifically a new news website called Rascal, Rascal rascal.news, which covers all things in TTRPGs. So it will be very interesting to see this go. It is a subscription-based service. The, the, the higher you subscribe, the more content that you will get from them. And their intention is to do more investigative journalism style stuff into the world of TTRPGs. The big question is for me is always, is the TTRPG... It, TTRPG industry big enough to handle and to support this kind of investigative kind of news. I hope so. I certainly hope so. EN World, for example, had a Morris from EN World had an incredible investigative article that he did on the rise and fall of evil genius games. This kind of very interesting article about a game company and how they try to dance the very thin line between Web3 technology and TTRPGs. And I would say did not apparently dance on it very well. It was a really interesting article. And I remember reading this article and thinking like, this article is kind of like bigger than we deserve, right? (laughs) That like given the TTRPG industry, what we do, it was really interesting to read. And, you know, really, really, but I was like, man, like he's taking a lot of risk in writing it and a lot of work in writing it. And I don't know that the end results of the writing are going to be a huge profound thing just because the industry is not that big. And like, you know, I I don't know. It feels there's, there's, there's so few people that can kind of come in and support it. So it'll be interesting to see rascal news, how they go out. Obviously many of the writers, the one in particular, Lynn Codega, who wrote about the OGL back last year and broke a lot of news about the OGL. They're writing for Rascal News. So it'll be very interesting to see what kind of articles come out. And I hope that our whole hobby is able to support independent writers who are writing kind of these deeper investigative reports. So that's Rascal News. Looks very interesting. Ginny D on her excellent YouTube channel. Wow, that was loud. Ginny D has a really, really good and what I think is a very important video about playing D&D with ADHD. And whether you have ADHD or not, I think it's a really, really good video to watch for a, a bunch of different reasons. One is if you don't have ADHD, it is a good view into what it's like to play the game if you do. And ADHD is one of those things where like there are many times where it's sort of undiagnosed or people don't really, you know, there were different degrees of it. And in some cases, like many of us, I would say sometimes I look at the traits, I'm like, I think I do that, right? That it can be useful to see all of the different ways that this can manifest at our table and the different things that we can do when it's going on, both from the standpoint of a GM who's running a game for people who might have ADHD to being a player in a game if you if you have ADHD. And many of the tips and tricks that are in this video are things anybody can do, regardless of whether you have ADHD or not, they can make your game better. That idea, one, one of the ones that I resonate with very, very strongly with is that a way to keep busy during your game and stay engaged is taking notes. And I think players who take notes during the game, they're like gold. They're the best. And it's probably, I think it is the number one thing other than like not being a jerk, right? Other than your lowest level of please don't be a jerk. Hey, look, I have a marker in my pocket from my last game. Last time I wore this shirt. (laughs) I'm just talking about age. I'm totally distracted by this marker in my pocket. So other than not being a jerk, 
I think that the next best thing a player can do to really engage with the game and be a benefit to the group and really kind of just be a good participant at the table is taking notes. Even if other people are taking notes, if you're taking notes, I know for me, this is definitely true. I get distracted very easily when I'm playing in a RPG. And one thing that helps me considerably is taking notes, drawing pictures, in taking drawing maps. And the players that I know that do this at my games are more engaged and tend to be look like they're having more fun at the table. Take notes. Really, really good video. Very, very well done. I know she worked very hard putting this together, and I cannot recommend it enough. So it's doing well, 120,000 views. So it's doing just fine without me. But I still wanted to bring it up on the show because I think it's a really good video for everybody to watch, and I would recommend it. You will find a link to that in the show notes. Shadow of the Weird Wizard. We have been waiting for Shadow of the Weird Wizard is the most anticipated new RPG of 2024, according to EN World's big poll that they did on the most sought after new RPGs. And Shadow of the Weird Wizard is now out that the players. So this got confusing to me. I was confused. And I think if I'm confused, I tend to think probably I'm not exceptional in this that if i'm confused probably lots of people are confused shadow the weird wizard the book that came out is the player's guide and there is not yet a gm's guide which is going to be called secrets of the weird wizard i was genuinely confused i I got it and i was like oh look shadow the weird wizard i'm so excited and i opened it up and i read it i'm like wow he managed to pack it all in only 275 pages that's amazing because like shadow the demon lord was way bigger than that not that i I wasn't like arguing about the page size being a problem or anything like that but i was like oh that's kind of small and then I got to the end. I'm like, where's the rest? Where's, where are the monsters? Where's the GM guidelines? Where's the you know campaign plot line stuff? And then I was, oh, there's a secret. And I had to ask on my own Discord server, hey, why is there not anything else? And they said, oh, because he's doing Secrets of the Weird Wizard 2, which is the GM side, and that's not done yet. So I'm going to do a much more in-depth review, or not a review, but like a spotlight of Shadow of the Weird Wizard when both books are out. I, I think until we have both books in hand and can really look at how the whole thing plays out together, there's really the time to take a look at it. So am I recommending it now? I mean, it's the most anticipated RPG. And if you know you're going to get it, you might as well get it. I would probably wait till you can get both books, frankly. And I backed the Kickstarter, so I'm going to be getting both, both books regardless. And it looks really cool, but I have not dove into it yet. And I'm not super excited to dive into it yet because I don't yet know what the GM side of things look like. So it did come out this past week. I had a bunch of people who said, hey, why aren't you talking about Shadow of the Weird Wizard? You're talking about all this other stuff. Well, the reason that's the reason why. There, there are two books. And I, I think it's reasonable to be confused with the fact that there's two books instead of one because Shadow of the Demon Lord, which is a parallel in the names, was the complete sy- system in one book. And Shadow of the Weird Wizard is hitting that same pattern on the name, but isn't the full game. So I can see why people uh, are confused, uh, upset. I mean, you know, don't spend the money if you don't want to spend the money. So, you know, but, and I could see if you bought it on like a whim and you didn't realize it, that you could be further upset because you realize like, ah, oh, this game's gonna be twice as much as I thought it was. And that's reasonable, right? Like, but you know, hopefully you do a little reading. And then if you're interested in Shadow of the Demon Lord and you heard it from me, now you know that this is the player's guide to the book and the uh, GM's guide is going to be a separate thing. But I'm very much, it's still anticipated for me. I'm really, really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to diving in. From what I've read, I was reading through some of the, 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 the 10 things in the book and it looks really cool. But we'll do a spotlight on that when Secrets of the Weird Wizard is out so that we can look at the entire system together. Today, I want to talk a little bit about character factions. This is something I've used in my game over the many years and decades, and is actually kind of wired into the game. The 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide, for example, has a whole section on character factions and renown and growing your reputation and growing with with all of that. I had big factions in my Eberron game. Eberron is a really big setting that has a big focus on these factions and you can kind of choose these factions. So I did that too. So what I'm talking about today isn't something that's completely brand new or completely revolutionary, but where it really would have mattered and had I, I wish I had done this sooner was in my Shadow Dark RPG where I really found that if I had tied the characters to factions, the game would have overall gone smoother. And today we're going to talk about how you can use factions to better tie the characters to the world of your game. So this is an article that is going to come out sometime in Sci Flourish, but I wanted to talk about it here on the show as well. 
And one of the, where it really kind of came up for me is in the Shadow Dark RPG. And the reason why is that characters in Shadow Dark RPG, in the Shadow Dark, have a tendency of dying. And they die a lot. And what can happen is if your quests are tied to specifically to the backgrounds of the characters and the characters die, the player's connection with the quest in the world severs as well. That as long as that character is around doing what they're doing, you have this connection between the player, the character, the quest and the, and the, and the goals in the world. But if the character dies, all of those threads get broken. But factions are a way to help with that. And that's because you can have the players tied to the faction instead of the players just tied to the character. As your player is tied to the character and their quests and the quests are coming from the faction, if the character dies, they still have the same quests. So an example would be in my Shadow Dark RPG, for example, let's say all of the characters decided that they were connected to Titania, the fairy queen. And she had this goal of, I need you to go out to these old dungeons and pick out magic items and bring them back to me so we can get them out of this world before this world is destroyed. It's a very dark storyline, but let's say the characters pick that faction and that's what they did. Now, even if the character dies and the new character comes comes out, if the new character is still tied to Titania, they still have the same quest. The quests are abstracted from the characters. That can work really, really well. Where it can also work well is if you have players who want to switch characters. So I did this in my Dark Sun game. In my Dark Sun game, we had one core faction that was like an adventurer's guild built from former gladiators in the world of Athos, right? In the, in the, in the, in the main city in Athos. I, I can't remember the name of the city. He is going to yell at me. But I can't remember the name of the city. Tyr? Tyr, I think it was called. So they were all from the town, the, the city of Tyr. They were all belonged to this Adventurer's Guild. And the nice thing was they would get quests from the Adventurer's Guild, but the players could decide which characters they wanted to sort of check out to, to go do the quest. And that way, it, they could switch characters whenever they wanted to, and they all knew that they were still on the same quest. So when you have a faction like this, and when the faction is generating the quests that the players are interested in, the, it, it is now abstracted from the characters. So they can continually be switching out which characters are involved. But even if you're not switching your characters out, even if the players are playing the same characters and they like it, it's still a really convenient hub to have one major faction that all the characters are tied to that is the one generating all of the quests and the motivation for what they're doing. Now, there's a couple of other ways that you can do this. You can, of course, have multiple factions and then have the characters tied to those multiple factions. The Adventurers League for Forgotten Realms actually did this in the early days, where when you generated your character, you tied it to one of the five major factions of the Forgotten Realms, like the Harpers or the Emerald Enclave or uh, any of the other factions that they had, the Zinterim, uh, Order, of the, Order of the Gauntlet, and Lord's Alliance. Hey, look, I can remember all five factions. So you would have the characters tied to those individual factions. The problem was when you got a group together and the group were tied to different factions, then they all sort of had competing goals that maybe lined up, but not necessarily. So the Zinterim might have a different approach for dealing with an NPC than somebody from the Harpers would. Then there's also this question of why would Harpers and Zinterim be hanging out together anyway? So there's always these kind of like little bits of friction point when you have characters with different factions. The same I found was true with 13th Age, which sort of has factions built into the game that you play. You have the icons, the 13 icons. And in 13th Age, you actually determine what your relationship is with multiple factions, independent of the other characters. What I found when I ran 13th Age, it was, it was far better for me to narrow down that list of factions into basically three good ones and three bad ones. And that way you would have negative relationships with the bad ones and you'd have positive relationships, positive or neutral ones with the good ones. And then the players tended to collide on the same icons, which meant it was easier for me to steer the direction of the game, knowing that most of the people were tied to the emperor and most of them were fighting the three. It really worked out well. So I would actually recommend narrowing your factions down and even ideally having the players decide on one faction that they all belong to during the session zero of your game. Now, the neat thing here is that sounds like railroading. Oh, Mike, you're railroading the characters by saying they all have to belong to one faction. A little, but better is, hey guys, here are four different factions you can choose from. So here's the game that we're going to play. Here's the theme of the game that we're going to play. And here are four factions that are, that are different. And you could even tie the factions to different alignments. And actually, if you look at like how Eberron builds their noble houses and stuff like that, that they're kind of like this. They have sort of different alignments. So you could have your lawful good faction, your lawful neutral, or you could have your lawful good faction, your chaotic good faction, your lawful neutral faction, and your chaotic neutral faction. And sort of bring them out there so they have 
different ways that they're approaching the world. Each of these factions have a different way that they do it. I would probably, unless you really want to have an evil campaign, and I'm not real big on evil campaigns. I know there are definitely people that love them and God bless, but I prefer to have ones that deal generally with good and neutral factions. So that's a way that you can have four factions that are sort of divergent from each other and have different ways that they're approaching the adventure. And then the players have the agency to say, we know what the theme of the adventure is and we know what these factions are. Let's pick the one that fits the kind of gameplay and the kind of style that we want. You have your players discuss it. They generally come to a consensus. The people who are against it, you ask them, are they are they still okay with it? If they're not, then you go back to the consensus again until eventually all the players decide, yeah, it would be really cool to all join this one particular faction. And then the advantage is now that they're all tied to that faction, it's way easier for you to guide the direction of where the campaign is going to go and know what path that they're going to take and know what quests are going to resonate because they've all tied themselves to that one hub faction to begin with. And then, of course, if you have characters that come in and out, if you have players where they're only in and out of the game every so often, they're still tied to that same faction. So they come in with the quest pre-built. Like in Shadow Dark, if a character dies, but a new character shows up, the new character already knows all of the quests that you went on because they have the same quests. It's a really, really convenient way to have this kind of central hub to your game that ties all the characters together, ties them all to a central theme, and ensures that even if the characters are moving in and out, the players still have the quests that they're going on. So I think that knowing how to use character factions, and again, you can read about them in the 2014 DMG. These are not totally unique ideas they were wired into adventurers league for many years eberron is built on them many many different rpgs have these kind of factions built into them with this purpose but i think it's a a really powerful way of tying your players to the game that they're playing in let's talk about statistics so if you're familiar with statistics at all you probably are aware of the median and the mean of something The mean is the average of a big set of numbers. Let's say you're measuring out the total household income in America. If you take the mean of it, you would add up all of the amounts of household incomes in America and you would divide it by the total number and that would be the average or the mean. Mean and average are the same thing. Statistics In statistics, they call it the mean. In the median is the middlemost point. And when you have like a big steep curve in something, like if it's not following a normal curve and instead is really high as in like, hey, we're all being matched up against Elon Musk and his salary. And the what happens is your average goes way out, your mean goes way out, but the median is actually much less than that. An example of this is like how much money people have saved for retirement. If you say, well, we're gonna take the mean of the amount of money that people have saved for retirement, it's often like in the millions of dollars. If you take the median, it's actually like $100,000 or even less. And that's because the middle point is actually different than the mean. There's one other little bit of statistical thing like this called the mode. The mode is the highest number that exists in any given category. So if you were to say we're going to bin all of the amounts of retirement savings that people have in America into $100,000 bins, you would then say which bin has the highest number of people in it. That would be the mode. Now, in many circumstances, when you're doing a statistical analysis like this, what you find is the results are multimodal, that there's actually a few different spikes in different places, right? And that's where we get into the world of tabletop role-playing games. Tabletop role-playing games in almost in many, many, many different areas where we all talk about it and discuss it is a multimodal situation. There are many right answers. An example be an example would be which is the best role-playing game? I have my choice. You have your choice. Lots of people have their choices. It is a multimodal problem. There isn't one right answer. There is no perfect RPG. Not for everybody. You could say like, well, 5e is the most popular right now and has been the most popular by a great degree. So it's clearly the best one ever. I bet you you'd have a lot of people that would say, no, it's not. And in fact, I've heard lots of people say, no, it's not. So the answer is maybe your group likes Pathfinder 2 more. There's lots of groups that do much prefer Pathfinder 2. That's a multimodal problem. They are not wrong. For them and their drives and what they desire, Pathfinder 2 is a better system than 5e. Other people love OSR kind of stuff. Oh, 5e. And you'll see YouTube videos, shock face YouTube videos of people saying this 5e is the worst. And this game, Shadow Dark, fixes everything that 5e had problems with. Not for the people who love 5e. 
It doesn't. Shadow Dark is awesome. I'm loving Shadow Dark. I also still love 5e. When it comes to tabletop role-playing games and the discourse we have, there are two truths that come into this. Truth number one is that there are many, many different ways to play the game or to even play different games and how we play those games. Truth two is oftentimes when we have one we like, we cannot understand why people like the other ones. We just can't even put it in our minds. This idea that there are many right answers in TTRPGs exists in so many different facets that are go even go beyond what your favorite system is. What your favorite system is, is definitely has lots of different spikes about people that like one particular thing over another particular thing. Some love story focused games. Some love super tactical crunchy games. Some people like high fantasy. Some want science fiction. People want all different kinds of things. And we don't have to say, we don't all have to come to a point of agreement and say, oh, we've all decided together. We finally came to a consensus. And there's only this one RPG and everybody will stop playing all the others and play this one. No, we all get to play whatever RPG we want. And they're all very different from one another. But that it's not just in the games, but in how we play. You could say, oh, do you love theater of the mind? Do you love abstract maps? Do you love tactical play? Do you love maps and miniatures at your table? Do you like digital tools for running your maps and miniatures at the table? All of those are different right answers. You get to decide which ones work best for you. And now we'll come to the four words that would make the discourse of TTRPGs so much better. Are you ready? Take these four words, bring them into your heart, make them part of your dialogue, change out one part of how you say something with another part, and you will find your discourse is far better. Ready? Are you ready for it? It's not for me. It's not for me. When you are in a discussion and somebody says, I really love this system. And you're like, wow, I hate that system. Instead of saying, wow, I hate that system or that system's terrible. Say, huh, well, it's not for me. And they can't argue with that. <laughs> They're not going to come back and be like, no, it is for you. No, well, no, it's not like it is or it isn't. Pathfinder 2, not for me. I've played it. I think it's actually really good. The production value is really cool. I totally understand why people dig it. It's not for me right? 5e is for me. I really, I, I really like 5e. It's not for me all the time, but I really like it. I look at Shadow Dark. Shadow Dark definitely is a game I love. I look at old school essentials. And it's not for me. And the reason why is like it, it hung on a lot a little too tightly to BX stuff. I'm not saying that people who like old school essentials are wrong and they should play something different and blah, 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 blah. I'm not saying that at all. They love it. They love it. Who am I to tell them that they don't love something? They totally can love it. It's not for me. And likewise, 5e probably isn't for them. For those people who said, oh, Shadow Dark fixes everything that 5e had problems with and 5e blah, 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 blah. Well, you could also say, well, 5e wasn't for me. This game is. Totally cool, right? And there's no argument. There's no argument about that. We can all agree that we have different things that we enjoy because that's what makes the game diverse. Now, the, the Discord can be very useful in talking about why something is for us and why something isn't for us. What are the parts of it that we like? What are the parts of it that we don't? And we can all learn from that. And if we're going into the discussions by learning from one another about different things. If we can say, huh. So I, I'll give you another example of, of the many right answers of TTRPGs. I was talking about how much I loved the Cypher system on the GM side. And that one of the things I really loved about Cypher was that the GM never had to roll any dice. That the GM just gets to come up with these situations and build them out and come up with the levels of different threats. And from the level of threat, you could build out everything else in the world. It meant that I needed no books in front of me. All I needed to do was remember one to 10. If I can remember one to 10, I can come up with any threat in that game. I don't need any dice. I don't need pretty much anything in order to run that game. I found that great. A good friend of mine was like, oh man, I can't imagine playing a game where you don't roll dice as the GM. I love rolling dice. I would never not want to roll dice. Why do I buy all these dice if I'm not going to roll in the game? Are they wrong? No. Am I wrong? No. We both get to decide that we want different things. He And I'm not saying I don't like rolling dice. Sometimes I do. I'm, I'm playing lots of games where I roll dice. But I also really enjoyed playing a game where I didn't roll dice. So when somebody says, oh, I hate that game, you don't roll dice, what they're saying is, well, that's not for me. Because for me, I really want to be rolling dice at the table. 
We can get into details like static monster damage. I, after playing 13th Age, became definitely enamored with the idea that we don't really need to roll dice for monster damage. And it adds extra time and extra math and everything like that. And and now 5e, it's kind of in the default, it's static monster damage, even though you can still roll. But most people are still rolling. Are they wrong? No. Am I wrong? No. We, we both get to decide what we want to do. I think it's useful to talk about why I like static monster damage. And it was useful for me to hear from people who don't, where the biggest issue was variance, right? That they they said, like, I don't like using static monster damage because it's too, it's too consistent that the players are going to be able to game the system because they know they're always getting hit for 24 damage every time they get hit. So therefore, like, they can just get, oh, if, as long as I have 25, I'll be good. And then I learned from that. And what I learned was, well, what if instead of rolling big handfuls of dice or, or not rolling dice at all that we instead did 1d6 you subtract three from the static damage and add 1d6 so instead of having like 12d6 plus whatever you say it's 1d6 plus 38 right and that had just enough variance that they couldn't count on it being anything specific it was just enough that it made it harder for the players to recognize exactly how much they're getting hit for and was made it much easier to roll at the table. So like I've now been using that approach. I like it a lot. I've actually been taking the static damage amounts from Forge of Foes and doing that minus three plus one D6. I've been wiring it in my own notes. So that's really easy for me to just roll with one D6 because rolling with one D6 and adding it to a number is really easy for me to do. It's really fast, almost as fast as static damage. Uh, and it still gives that little element of variance. So that was one where we had a conversation. I, I recognize that people love rolling dice. I think some of the People that roll dice could understand why I like static damage. And then I came to a, an idea of like, oh, well, I can take the bent. Knowing what, why they were liking what they liked was another reason. I'll give another example. Theater of the Mind versus Gridded Combat. There are really good arguments f against Theater of the Mind. For example, somebody with, who has aphantasia can't really understand what the hell is going on in a battle if you don't have something to look at. Ginny D talked about this in her video about uh, playing D&D with ADHD, that being too abstract, it's just for some people, it's impossible to really understand what the hell's going on. The flip side is, I don't really like tactical gridded play because I find it too nitpicky and too atomic when we're talking about great big fantasy stories. So what's a consensus that we that can kind of pull me in? And that was abstract maps that what if you kind of drew a map, but you didn't worry about fixed distances? What if you had miniatures on your table or a nice display or whatever, but you didn't worry about five foot increments? You didn't worry about somebody being five feet out. You just said, sure, you can go up there and move. Is that a good consensus? I don't know that a lot of people have jumped on that idea. I do know. I think it was like the last time I did a poll, about 20% of people used abstract maps. I now use it exclusively and I love it. It's a good way to offset those issues of not being able to see what's going on with still focusing on the high action of what's going on in a game. Is it the right answer though? No. Are there still people who love to focus on gridded tactical play? Yes. Are they wrong? No. It's not for me right? Super gridded tactical play is not for me. Abstract maps is for me. I really like abstracts. Theater of the mind is also for me. I really like it. Should they, for them, theater, theater of the mind is not for them. Now, granted, like when you're dealing with something like Aphantasia, it really isn't for them. Like they really cannot play when you're doing it. But also I have a friend who's blind. Guess what? Gridded play does not work well for her, right? Because she cannot see. I heard her say, she made a statement that stuck with me. She made it years ago. And she said one time she sat down at a game and somebody started drawing a map out at the table and it took him a long time and she knew he was doing it and she knew everything he is doing is just a waste of time for me, right? That I'm, we're spending like 15 minutes here that is going to be of absolutely no value to me whatsoever. That was something that stuck with me. That was a bit of information that I got that made me think about this whole thing. So we can certainly all learn from each other. Absolutely, we can learn from each other by having this discourse. It's when we feel like the thing we've got is the right answer and we cannot imagine why anybody else likes it, which to me is really a big factor. So in conclusion, I think... There are a few main points that we can understand about TTRPG discourse and talking with other people and learning from another that I think would generally elevate the whole conversation up. And that's kind of what I want to do. One, 
recognize there are many right answers to many, many aspects. Every aspect, almost every aspect, because the ones that are really not popular, they just don't even come up. We, nobody, nobody hangs on to them, so they don't come up. There are so many different ways that we can enjoy this hobby that there are many right answers to how we enjoy it. The games we play, how we play them, all the different kind of tips and tricks and the way we prepare, all that stuff. Many, many right answers that exist. It is also really hard for us to understand why some people are choosing right answers that aren't ours. That's it's just it's our human nature. We assume ours is the one and we need to kind of break that idea. We can recognize that there are right answers that aren't for us. We can focus on learning from one another instead of just debating. If you walk into a debate and your argument is, I believe this so soundly that I cannot have my position changed, but I'm going to attempt to change the position of another. That's probably not a great way to have a conversation. Only if you are likewise saying, I bet I could learn from this other person. And from what I learned could potentially change my view. The idea of adding 1d6, subtracting three and adding 1d6 to static damage was sort of a way that I learned from the conversations that I had. And it's really powerful to say something just isn't for you rather than trying to cut down someone else's truth, someone else's preference. And it's really powerful to use the phrase, it's not for me, instead of trying to cut down somebody's preference. I had a really funny conversation with somebody on a, on a Discord server that was not my own, where we were talking about different styles of games. And somebody said, 5e is objectively terrible. They said that 5e is objectively terrible. And I was like, well, I know a lot of people that are playing and enjoying 5e and have enjoyed and played 5e for 10 years, including myself. So objectively terrible doesn't sound exactly accurate to me. I think that certainly there are things that are could use some work because that's why I've been doing what I do. But I'd say it's a pretty for me. It's been a great system. And then they said, in my opinion, 5e is objectively terrible. And my head kind of broke a little bit on that statement. I was like, how can something be subjective and objective, right? How about they just say, you know what? 5e isn't for me. Or 5e isn't for me, and here's why. Here are the, here are the problems that I have when I'm trying to run 5e, and it's not for me. That is a total valid way to handle it. Something can just not be for you. And, and, and it's totally cool to have something that's not for you. And it's totally cool to be into things. One of the things that makes this, in my opinion, the best hobby in the world, I think it's the best hobby in the world or I wouldn't be spending the time on it, is that we are allowed to have all of these different divergent views and still enjoy the same hobby. If we were all focused on one video game, only the developers of that video game, their opinion is the only one that would matter. There would be an objective truth, an objective uh, right answer that might not be yours, but you're stuck with it anyway. I, I'm playing games right now, but that's absolutely the case. The people who are making the game have a right answer that isn't mine, and there's nothing I can do about it. The TTRPG industry is totally not that way. We always have other options. We always have other games that we can play, other ways to prep, other ways to run it, all different kinds of things. And it's awesome. For 10 years, for 15 years, I've been writing on Sly Flourish. For 10 years, I've been playing 5e. I've been learning constantly, learning new things, having conversations, experiencing new ideas, trying things out, throwing things away that didn't work for me, keeping things that did work for me, and trying to share all of that information. And I think it's really powerful for, we, for, for us to do so. It's not for me. Three super powerful words that I think can change all of the discourse that we have in the world of TTRPGs for the better. I hope you agree. If you don't, then it's not for you. Every month on the Sly Flourish Patreon, we have a monthly Q&A. Any patron can ask any RPG-related question. I answer all of them on Fridays. Some of those questions make it here to the show. Other times, they become their own videos or catalysts for future articles and things like that. Printable Hero says, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on how many most official WotC campaign maps aren't tailored for printing out and running miniatures on them at actual home tabletops. Scale is often too big. No thought to how the layout could be broken down to print easy. Easier. Lots of dead rooms or two narrow hallways. Feels like very little level gameplay design goes into them. I've always found it interesting how playtesting level design for player experiences and video game levels are universally expected, but seems like TTRPGs barely consider it even at the uh, level of big names like Watsi. 
Uh, obviously, budgets are different, but st- we're still talking about fairly simple top-down 2D maps, not big 3D environments with lots of assets, and as an end product. Anyhow, feels like a missed opportunity, or maybe an opportunity for entrepreneurial map makers to supplement official content, to better facilitate using miniatures at the tabletop. Printable Heroes, of course, running uh, an excellent Patreon for cool printable tokens, maps. They, they make VTT tokens. They also make printable stand-up tokens. I've used them. They're very, very cool. I think they've partnered with some groups to make uh, two two and a half D stand up tokens that you can use at your game. So clearly an interest in how maps work at the table. And the answer is they've never worked well at the table <laughs> for 50 years. I have talked about the intractable problem of maps for RPGs. This uh, given given the last topic I just talked about on on something on having many right answers, there are many different right answers for maps and in my opinion none of them are fantastic, <laughs> right? There's there's few of them where you go, "Oh wow, that works really well." Obviously, I would say the biggest difference that's happened with maps in probably the last 10 years has been going to digital play. And I think for printable heroes, I think it's great that you've been making tokens available for printable heroes to use in for, for virtual tabletops, because there's many advantages to having a digital play. One is you can scale the map however you want to scale the map. So if you decide, wow, the map is too narrow, you can double its size. And now suddenly hallways go from five foot to 10 foot and so on. I've done this many times with like Dyson maps and things like that. Uh, also, you you have no limit on your tokens. It's also very easy for players to see where you are. You can make great big maps. You can use Fog of War, all kinds of things that really you can't uh, do when you're at your physical table. What's really interesting is during COVID, I switched over to virtual play. I used a lot of Albert Rodeo. I still use Albert Rodeo. And then I came back to running at the table again, and I was sort of lost. I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what I should be using. So, yeah, and another thing that goes on, this is a criticism of, of Wizards and, and Hasbro in general, but it probably, I would say particularly them, like Cobalt Press seem to figure it out. I don't know why Wizards can't. They just can't coordinate products. So back in the 4E days, they had dungeon tiles. They, they tried a few different things. They tried map, like big poster maps and map packs for the poster maps, but they were never tied to adventures that they published. So in, they would give you these big, beautiful, full color, 8, 24 by 36 poster maps that were pretty reasonably priced. You get like six maps apps for like 10 bucks or whatever they were very reasonably priced and yet they were not the maps that you had for adventures and sometimes you'd buy an adventure and it would include a poster map but only for like one or two rooms and you're like the adventure is huge it's got tons of stuff and their general expectation is yeah you're going to use a dry erase mat or or wet erase mat or you're going to use something else you're going to you're going to do some other map making thing so they'd have these beautiful maps in the books that you couldn't use at the table and part of it is cost. Part of it is that like if they were to include these big map packs, you'd have a problem. With Scarlet Citadel, Cobalt Press actually put out a map pack where every map in the book has a dry erasable map for it. Now, it would cost you like 130 bucks or something like that to buy both packs. I think in the Kickstarter, I think I think Wolfgang Bauer mentioned that they were losing money on the maps because they, they priced them low enough that people would buy them and then lots of people did. So that's that's not great either, that the idea that you're losing money on them. But the cool thing was every map that was in the adventure also had a map uh, of a physical map that you could lay out on the table. And then, of course, I played it online. I didn't need all the maps that I bought. So what are you going to do? There is just not a great solution for this. I think that that Wizards of the Coast in particular has always had trouble coordinating, selling a product that does something with maps with an adventure that actually needs maps. If you look at like the beautiful, beautiful maps in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, there is no way other than digitally to practically use those at your table because they're big, beautiful, full color maps. In some cases, they're absolutely huge. They're way bigger than you could print out on, on like a big map thing. So digital was pretty much the only way to do it. Or you hand draw it as best you can, but your hand drawn maps are not going to look near as good as the beautiful maps that are in there. So last year, I put together an article called Using Maps for In-Person Games that was focused specifically on this question of like, what can you do for maps? I talked about a lot of different approaches that people have used. I asked a lot of people what they use. I did a fair bit of research into into this thing. Uh, I offer references for it. And again, it's it's not great. Like there there are some that work better than others, but generally speaking, there is there's always trade-offs with whatever kind of maps you want. So if you want to see that, you can find a link in the show notes. The name of the article is Using Maps for In-Person Games. You can do a search on Sly Flourish and you can find it, but I'll link to it in the show notes as well. And that talks a little bit about the approaches that we use for maps. But the answer is there's not a great there's not a great answer. Victor N says, I've been using some shops from the excellent Wanderer's Guide to Merchants and uh, Merchants and Magic, and I'm debating the best way to convey the shop's inventories to players. Do 
you tell them everything that's for sale or perhaps hand them a list? Do you let them read full descriptions of magic items and their mechanics or do you convey the item's properties narratively? So one thing I do is if it if it's something complicated like a magic item, I usually don't expose like more than three of them. And one thing I think is worth considering is that not every merchant has magic items in stock and they don't always have the same magic items in stock there's usually like two or three and you can roll the nice thing is you can roll randomly to determine which magic items they have and a couple of them probably won't be super useful for the characters and they just pass on them the ones they are interested in they can pick i don't remember exactly how wanderer's guide to merchants and magic handles it whether it has a whole lot of magic items or not available but even if it does one thing you might do is just cut it down and, and get the decision paralysis you know help with the decision paralysis by having fewer items available and then yeah sure you could you could print out cards for them that could work you could if you're playing digitally you could send the text i, I do this i will send the text of the of the gear like in the discord server so they can see what it does i don't try to hide what it does i'm usually like if they have anybody who can reasonably understand what this item can do then they learn what it can do and and i just describe it to them like they, they just want to know it and why why get in the way of that why get in the way of the player figuring out especially if they're buying it there's one thing to get a magic item and you pick it up and you don't know what it does yet and you have to learn what it is over time it's something else if you're going to spend money on it you're not going to black you know buy a black box that might have a potion but you know what kind of potion is in it so i would probably tell them what it does i probably tell them exactly what it does again you could print it out you could paste it in a discord server even if you're playing in person you could still have like a, a group chat somewhere and say i'm pasting it in the group chat and you could read it there that that's it's pretty handy to have a discord server even if you are running an in-person game just for sharing information like that Victor G says, how do you how do you work in character backstories into Curse of Strahd? I just started Curse of Strahd with the party being taken into the midst and around Daggerford. We had a great session zero developing character backgrounds using the session zero system. However, now they're transported to a place unconnected to their background. Do I contrive connections between the two locations or just proceed with Curse of Strahd as written? Curse of Strahd is terrible for this kind of thing. Curse of Strahd is my favorite adventure, my favorite published adventure. I really, really love it. But it is a sandbox, and the sandbox is really tied to the idea that the characters wander in and all of their backgrounds are gone. Their backgrounds could still have an effect, but the likelihood that there will be connections between their backgrounds and the world that's going on inside the midst of Barovia is unlikely. Now, they might run into people. Now, it's possible people from their past have also gotten lost there. Maybe there's like an uncle who, or a great, great, great uncle who should have been dead 400 years ago, but is still living in the midst. So there are ways to tie it in. But yeah, a lot of their background that was tied back there is not going to be super relevant when they completely went to a different world. That's just sort of the nature of how Curse of Strahd works. It's just a different kind of adventure. So it's not complete zero. There's probably ways that you could tie the backgrounds in. Certainly the experiences that they've had could guide how they interact with the world around them. But there's probably not going to be a direct perfect connection between like the gods or the factions or, or NPCs or their families or anything like that. It probably you could get away with like one or two people from the character's past having also gotten lost in Barovia. If you're doing a session zero for Curse of Strahd, you probably want to account for that. It's, it's probably Victor. It's probably a little too late for you at this point. But you could if someone else is running it. I would probably run a Curse of Strahd session zero differently, accounting for the fact that their backgrounds are really not going to have much of a play when they actually go into when they go into Barovia. I think that's probably true for, for other adventures as well. I'm trying to recall, but there was some adventure or some campaign that I was running and I knew that there would not be a strong connection. And I just warned the players. I said, like, you can come up with a background. Your background is probably not going to, I think it was light of Zaraxxus. So I said to them, whatever backgrounds you have that are tied to the forgotten realms, you can hang on to them, but they're really not going to have much play once you leave Faerun. And they knew we were playing Spelljammer. So they knew they were heading away from Faerun. I said, it's just not likely that those backgrounds are going to come into play very much, which actually is kind of a problem with the adventure that works there too. Uh, I would say Planescape has the same problem where it's like, oh, I don't remember why we're here. You're like, oh, great. You wrote this whole background. You don't know what's going on. Mad Man Quail says AI tools. I use them a lot. They're useful, but a bit controversial. A bit. Google Bard is surprisingly, it's not called Bard anymore because Google loves to change other things. So now it's Google Gemini, but whatever. Back when this comment was written, it was Google Bard. Google Bard is surprisingly good at generating short pieces of throwaway text, book blurbs, descriptions of an improvised NPC, a script for an overhead conversation in a tavern. It can also generate ideas for adventure hooks, scenarios, puzzles, riddles. It's very powerful. Being image creator is similar, but creating incredible location images and NPC portraits. But I also feel cheap using it. I couldn't justify paying a professional to generate the volume of material and art, especially since it's so well taken 
tailored. My question is, is this a sign of things to come? Should we be concerned for the livelihood of artists and content writers? Are the days of paying for, for Describe account over? I am not your priest. Uh, I cannot absolve you of your AI sins. And all of us need to decide independently and individually how we feel about this, what we can do about it, where we draw the lines. We all need to figure this out. And it's changing constantly. It, it feels like it's changing weekly. Uh, I use generative AI stuff. I have used it to generate character portraits for my games. I've used it to generate tokens for my games. I've used it to, I don't use it much for text. I didn't find it to be particularly useful for, um, for generating content for my games. I did some stuff. So I, 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 I had an example where like I had a Darrow who was singing a song to a bunch of ghouls, keeping them enthralled. And I, 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 I had chat GPT whip up that song and that was like, I could not make that up. Right. So that one, I, I, I had it generated. I think I did it during the game. And that's another thing. Like you, it's a pretty decent improvisational tool because you can sort of whip something up like that pretty quickly. So like, if you want sort of like poems and stuff like that, I'm not good. I'm not a poet. And I'm not going to, like you say, I'm not going to pay somebody to do this. So I'm not taking money. The argument of like, are you taking money out of the hands of a creator? Well, the tools themselves are taking money out of the hands of creators just by their very existence. So it doesn't matter if you're saying, well, instead of using the AI tool, I am instead you know, I, I, I wouldn't be, I'd be paying somebody otherwise. I wouldn't be paying somebody otherwise. So it's okay to use the AI tool. The AI tools are built on everyone's intellectual property, like tons and tons and tons of intellectual property went into these. These are things that was valuable. You know, it's valuable because they still want it. So I'm very, I'm, I'm watching this, but I am torn and I'm living kind of in a position of like in super position. They are both bad. And I, my argument about why they're bad is, uh, you know, I, the, a common argument that I hear is, well, is it really that different than like somebody reading all of this stuff? Like it's not, you know, it's learning, it's not copying it. And you're like, it's also making billions and billions of dollars from my stuff. Like it, it indexed Sly Flourish and it used that. And I didn't get $5. They didn't send me a check for $5. They aren't even in many cases referencing back to me. So I give so much of my stuff away. I allow so many people to use so much of my stuff. I put tons of material into Creative Commons. I have like return and lots of our books have material that's out there in the Creative Commons. And all I ask for is attribution. All I say is if you use this stuff, say that you got it from me. And they can't do that, right? It just can't do that. And they're, and it's not a public good. This is not a service that they're putting out there like the internet or like email protocols or like Linux. This, these aren't services that everybody's like, oh yeah, this is making the whole internet better for everybody. No, these are like Google gave like $20 billion worth of resources to ChatGPT. It's valued at $80 billion or something like that. I think it's even more, right? Real money is going behind this to build closed systems. The art, the, one, a great argument I heard about open AI was all six letters are a lie. It is not open at all, right? It's not like they're handing the algorithms and you can go do it. They're very closed. They don't tell you how they do it. It's not really artificial because it's built on human, human stuff. It's built on all of our work and it's not intelligent because it's not learning. It's just, it's just parroting back stuff. So <laughs> it's a lie in all three words. Do I use it though? Yeah, I use it for coding a lot. Like I, I mentioned on my Shadow Dark side that I managed with ChatGPT at my side, was able to write an automator script, which I had never written before, that can take a markdown file and convert it into a well-formatted PDF. It required understanding four different languages that I don't know, none of which I know. I needed to know automator and how that worked. I needed to learn shell scripting, which I didn't really know. I had to learn all the parameters of Pandoc, which I didn't know. And I had to learn LaTeX. Pandoc, LaTeX, shell scripting, and automator are not super common, you know, areas where everybody knows it. I could have probably learned enough to be able to build that, but it might've taken me a few hours. Instead, I had it done in 15 minutes. That part of it was really powerful. So I am both really impressed with it and I use it and also horrified from it at the same time. And we all have to decide what that means for us. We, you know, we don't, I don't think, I don't begrudge anybody trying to figure this out one way or the other. And, uh, but also I cannot offer guidance on this either. We all have to decide what is appropriate for us and what we are willing to use and what we're willing to use it for. It's really tricky and it's going to change the world. I think like I, one thing is I've watched lots of technologies come and go and I've seen a lot of people poo-pooing AI stuff as like, oh, it's just a fad. It's just a bubble and it's going to go away. It's not really real. 
I don't know. I'm seeing it do some things. A friend of mine in, in, in this whole idea of building an automator script, he said, boy, it feels a lot like the Matrix where you say, hey, I need to fly a Bell HH-62 helicopter, you know, and then your eyes flicker and now you can fly a helicopter. And he said, it's actually more like you can fly a Bell HH-62 helicopter over to that location over there. Because like, I don't know everything about LaTeX now, but I learned enough LaTeX to be able to do that one thing. That's pretty impressive. And I don't think that they can just bottle that back up again. I do a lot of code work. And I'll tell you, having it sitting next to me is a game changer as far as I'm just just looking at my own experience with how I do this stuff. I consider myself a mediocre coder and a mediocre coder with that is really powerful, right? It has and, and it has like completely replaced something like digging into Stack Overflow because it's 10 times faster for me to ask it to, to give me a mundane piece of code that can solve a problem for me than it is for me to try to noodle through how to do it. So I don't have a great answer for you. We each have to decide what it means. I, I, it, is, it is definitely a, feels to me like a powerful thing that is coming at a big cost and we have to figure that out. So I think we all, we all have to watch it. Friends, I want to thank all of you for hanging out with me today while we talked about all things in tabletop role-playing games. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did and you want more stuff like this from me, the best thing you can do is subscribe to the Sly Flourish newsletter. It is absolutely free to sign up. You get a free adventure generator for signing up and you get a weekly RPG-related article sent directly to your inbox. You can find the link to the newsletter in the show notes. You can also join the Sly Flourish Patreon. It is a very low price. But it gives you access to all kinds of awesome tools to help you run your RPGs, source books like the City of Arches source book, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, the monthly Q&A, a dedicated Discord server, and a whole lot more. And you can pick up any of my books, including Return to the Lazy Dungeon Master, Forge of Foes, Lazy DM's Companion, Lazy DM's Workbook, and all the, la- all the fantastic adventure books on the Sly Flourish bookstore. Links for all of that are in the show notes. Thank you all so much. Have a great day and get out there and play an RPG. Bye-bye.